Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. A special thanks to Aniket sir and Leaf for giving me this opportunity to provide an overview of landscape architecture in India. Let's set, set forth a tone for the conversations that follow. This will be done in two parts. Today, we will be looking at the beginnings, education, pedagogy, and ethics. The Indian subcontinent's unique geography and diverse cultures have played an important role in shaping our taste and sensibilities pertaining to art and design. They have often pointed to the role of nature and designed outdoor environs towards well-being of land and the individual. The creators of these spaces have traditionally been associated with the act of planting, making gardens, reading sites to know its soil and water capabilities. The notion of creating an outdoor space was also infused with ideas derived from philosophy, cosmology, mythology, use symbolism and metaphor as modes of communicating the value of these design spaces and wilderness. It could be said that there was never really a designer or maker of open spaces, but it was more seen as a duty of a society to steward, nurture, protect and engage with land and its natural systems. There was a sense of gratitude and deep appreciation for land. That is the premise upon which our relationship with land rests. Profession of landscape architecture, landscape design and landscape planning as we see it today was never a grand singular idea, but a collective of many threads, many hands and minds over the centuries. Every region, due to its distinct biogeographical factors, had its own design idiom of garden cultures and spatial expressions. The medieval period saw an explosion of garden styles such as the Mughal, Deccani, Vijayanagara, Rajputana, to name a few, and alongside that, consciously looked at land management strategies. Invasion and colonization at a subcontinent scale has been a recurrent event in history, which has influenced and subsumed many of these nuances in favor of a common way of looking at land systems and garden traditions. In the modern era, early semblances of engagement with garden can be traced to the efforts of a few foresters, ecologists, geographers, and botanists. Under the patronage of crown rule, the intent was limited to exploring and mapping the subcontinent's landscape, seeking economic gain and medical advancement and resource evaluation. The creation of forest acts disenfranchised local communities dependent on the forest and diverted these resources to the growing industrial needs. The idea of conservation, experimenting with plant material for agroeconomic gain led to the setting up of botanical gardens in the subcontinent. Over the years, with trained superintendents, especially from few, these gardens opened their doors towards use as public spaces. The propagation and availability of plants triggered the idea of using exotic plants in private gardens, a space which was till then largely utilitarian in purpose. In years to come, these gardens and their few trained superintendents set forth points of reference in a manner in which the outdoor spaces should be designed and managed. The prestigious position of superintendents of public gardens by the 1940s came to be occupied by few trained Indians who were committed to the core principles outlined by the previous generations, but also diversified the role and responsibilities of these gardens. They continued to create spaces within these public parks with horticultural exuberance and occasionally added to the expressions of spatial design. Some of them also took up commissions for patrons. The period from 1947 to 1971 was of great political churn, deeply connected to the birth of nationalism and the idea of nation. This period saw major geopolitical restructuring and setting up of planning commissions establishment of capitals, uh, administrative centers, institutes, rural development centers, and infrastructure resource creation. It was a crucial time for the young nations to demonstrate economic growth and capability. There was tremendous need for skilled architects, planners, and engineers, which brought in many international names and our very own to instill the idea of nationalism through architecture, which was true to Pakistan and Bangladesh as well. Nepal, a country that was never colonized, 
also opened its valley for development to keep up with its neighbors. Sri Lanka was well on its way towards a more rooted expression of modernism. The 50s also saw establishment of many architecture courses across the country as extensions to their art schools to equip the, na equip the nation in the years to come. These were crucial steps to address the need within the country. The natural landscape around this time was seen more as a resource meant to be tapped for infrastructure growth and food security. The advent of national highway programs, creation of hydroelectric stations and dams, agricultural policies with heavy emphasis on rapid gain, the use of exotics like prosopis for rapid biomass generation and greening, and import of seeds were some of the common events throughout the subcontinent. Architecture and urban development were taking strides. To match their pace, barring a few individuals, botanical gardens were seen as immediate resource centers. It was during this time the horticultural departments were formulated alongside agricultural departments whose directions were now very different. The horticultural departments uh, were now tasked with the responsibility of creating parks and open spaces, setting up nurseries, propagating and distributing plants, greening up cities, etc. The industrial townships, factories, power stations and campuses had an open space component which was largely dealt by them. There was an evident gap. It was around this time the country saw its first generation of landscape architects. Armed with education from England, America and France, they brought in various sensibilities and uncompromised ethics of working with land. Through their works, they demonstrated various capabilities of a landscape architect. Professor Ram Sharma, architect with masters in landscape architecture and masters in architecture, introduced a whole new capability of planning and design. Through his work, he demonstrated an integrated approach of architecture at the level of site and civic open spaces. His works also include the design of scenic highways executed as per his meticulously drawn plans. The process involved painstaking mapping and exhaustive studies of topography, geology, hydrology, forest cover, and scenic quality. This was uncharted ground for a landscape architect in India. The first of a kind which looked at ecological basis for aligning roads in a landscape. Architect Ravindra Bhan wanted to be a cinematographer. Eventually, he found his way to architecture and studied landscape architecture later on at UPenn. He worked with McHarg and introduced the McHargian method of meticulous land suitability analysis in times when data was inadequate. He believed that this method was the most scientific when it came to working with land and was the way forward. Professor Prabhakar Bhagwat nurtured his love for plants under his father Balchandra Bhagwat a superintendent at the Pune Empress Botanical Gardens. He studied landscape architecture under Brian Hackett at Newcastle upon Tyne. His knowledge of plants, plant ecology, and the manner in which simple ecological actions can be applied to revive ecosystems has been demonstrated across his works. Architect Kishore Pradhan, with a master's in landscape architecture and horticulture from France, advocated attention to open spaces and their role in enlivening a city. Apart from private commissions, he worked extensively on parks and public spaces, especially in Mumbai and Hyderabad. He believed for the profession to be noticed, it has to work more in the public realm. His practice was very crucial in dense cities like Mumbai, which was rapidly depleting its open spaces and connect with nature. Architect Satish Khanna, with Masters in Landscape from the University of Pennsylvania, worked under McHarg before setting up his practice in India. At an early stage, he brought an entirely new understanding to the capabilities of profession in providing directions for land development, especially at very large scales through environmental assessments, siting tactics, and natural resource management. Professor Shaheer, a trained architect, urban designer and landscape architect, played a significant role in the subsequent years by lending the profession with a whole new vocabulary to design and many a lenses to understand, appreciate and introspect about the profession. 
His work in the realm of historic sites, memorials and public parks brought about a new understanding of landscape architect's capability in conservation and urbanism. Thus, the first generation showed us various ways of engaging in practice and the many directions it can offer. They also helped further the profession by setting up academic programs, teaching in them and writing extensively. Most importantly, they brought dignity very earlier on. There was a voice now, that of a landscape architect. It demonstrated unique capability and skills that address land, open spaces and the interstices between the buildings. This helped lay foundation to the profession, its pedagogy, sensibilities, and possibilities of practice. The subsequent generations have shown immense responsibility in forging the trajectory of the profession in many directions by constantly pushing the ambit and expanding the role of the landscape architect. This was achieved through consistent efforts and high professional standards in demonstrating capability. Today, there are about 15 schools with master's program, about 100 odd practices and about 700 landscape architects in the country. This was achieved over the past 50 years due to the consistent efforts of a few. But the rising numbers also see a huge gap between education and practice, perhaps due to lack of inspiring teachers and an outdated curriculum. A curriculum that doesn't acknowledge works within the country and the challenges that the profession faces in present times. Though some courses have evolved to keep pace with the present global trajectory, a few others seem to struggle. Establishing credibility still seems to be a recurrent process for every new entrant into practice, whether it be for a small garden or a large master plan. This is one of the greatest hurdles that ought to be overcome for a profession that is now more than 50 years old, that is capable of bringing sheer delight to the everyday, as well as offering solutions to the larger regional problems pertaining to land across scale and beyond bounds.